Hi, Peter Borker here and welcome to today's edition of the Transition Guy. Now joining me today in the studio is Brett Rosenthal, who is the founder of the Arm of the Pool. Brett, welcome to today's edition. Hey Peter, good morning. Thanks for having me. The Arm of the Pool. What is the Arm of the Pool? The Armour Report, you know, it stands for Algorithmic Risk Management Research. And what it really is, is um, a, a community we're building, what I like to call a virtual hedge fund, where we take the uh, experiences I've had over 30 plus years of investing and managing capital at a hedge fund, and we apply these hedge fund um, essential steps of investing for the individual investor. So I say a virtual hedge fund, right? You come join us as a subscriber, join us on our virtual trading desk, and we walk you through the processes of how to invest successfully in every market environment, much like a successful hedge fund would. So and we're talking about every market environment, right? That's correct. I mean, you know, there's a reason why the best hedge funds are always outperforming individual investors. And it doesn't matter what the environment is. I mean, hedge means that you're taking different positions on different sides, and it doesn't matter if it's a bull or a bear market, okay? And if you were to boil it down to the difference between a successful hedge fund manager and an individual, it comes to really three things for me. The, the first is an individual will you know, find an idea they want to invest in and use their portfolio as um, a basket to see if this great idea works. Hedge funds don't do that, right? They have a whiteboard. They put the idea on the whiteboard. They do exhaustive research. That's what we do at the Armour Report. We say, hey, here's our great ideas. We don't invest in them. We do the research first. Then the second stage is to use uh, what we were, you know, what are called algorithms, right? And individuals don't have access to the type of uh, algorithms I'm talking about. So I created this as a hedge fund manager, and then I use these hedge fund algorithms for the Armour Report. And I say, this is using these algorithms, getting rid of emotion and executing using an algorithm is the second stage. So when the algorithm says, let's put capital to work, we go to our whiteboard, find our best ideas, put capital to work. But we really wrap it all up. And this is the key, in my opinion, this is the key in a risk management strategy. You know, most individual investors don't even think about risk management. They're taught from a very early age you just put capital to work. The market always goes up over time, okay? And don't worry about managing the risk. And I just find that such a, a disservice to individuals. You know, it's like, yeah, that's true. I mean, if we held it for, you know, 30 years, the market goes up and there'll be a series of 50 plus percent corrections in your capital. And in the real world, that doesn't work, Peter. I mean, a lot of people are trying to retire on these assets. And, you know, so that strategy just doesn't hold water. And what we do here at the Armour Report is help individuals take these three essential stages and manage through what are, you know, particularly this moment in time, very difficult markets. Yeah, and for many people, very difficult times as well. I mean, if you look at it, most yeah. people, well, especially in the Western world, they probably haven't experienced rising inflation. I mean, we're talking about inflation, Every figures that are probably in real terms 10% plus. We haven't experienced that since the 70s, to be honest with you. And I don't know about you, but I was way too young to even understand what was going on, let alone. Completely. I mean, you see these pictures of you know lines at the gas station. I mean, we don't remember that, but I this is what my parents went through, right? And now we have here in the US working its way through Congress plans to um heavily restrict the prices of gasoline. Now we know capital controls don't work, Peter, and yet it's happening again. So it becomes a very difficult period. So bear in mind, we've got high inflation and it's not just in the US, it's across the globe. We've got an uncertain land war that is it's basically creating havoc all over the world. We've got supply chain issues that no one can control. It seems that half the working population has just disappeared off the planet. And we've all of a sudden had no access to labor. How does all of that really affect investing? Because I know there's a lot of people out there that are heavily nervous around investing 
a lot of people seem hell bound on holding on to cash. And we're talking about holding on to cash, keeping cash in the bank for 12 months plus, which really doesn't tend to work in a high inflation market because the rules have changed. And really holding on to cash long term in a high inflation market, cash is normally sort of called trash in this kind of environment. What do people do now? That's a great question, but I, I would like to challenge that cash is trash thought for just a moment, just a moment. I totally agree with you. You don't want to hold cash for 12 months. But I think that there's this compulsion to put money to work, this, this compulsion to, to, to invest, that you have to always be putting the cash into an investment. And there are distinct times in the market where uh, short-term money market funds protecting your capital while the market's imploding is the best way to put capital to work. So, right. and this is something that, that, you know, again, hedge funds are more than comfortable doing. But if you look at investing public, if you look at even mutual funds, they have rules that say they can't hold more than 5% cash. So they can't help it. They get buried as the market collapses. So on the one hand, I agree, you're not gonna hold cash for 12 months. But on the other hand, there are strategic times to hold cash, assets drop, and then you and then you step in. So, you know, how do you, where do we go? I'll tell you one thing that is very um, problematic right now. Wouldn't you say in the world you just described to me that the price of gold should be through the roof? It should be because it's a limited resource. Right, right. And yet the price of gold is going down with every other asset. You know, I remember a couple of months ago, there was debates on, you know, um, various uh, um, sites, Michael Saylor having debates about how Bitcoin's the new gold, right? And, uh, you know, apparently both sides were wrong because Bitcoin and gold are going down with the whole market. So you have a very strange market where at least in the 70s, when you had inflation, gold was going through the roof. You had a place to put capital, right? And at the moment, we have like 100% correlation. Everything seems to go down at the same time. But of course, out of that rubble will rise great investment opportunities. So we do have our eye on gold. At some point, we think it'll decouple. You know, um, we, we have a heavy focus on energy. Okay, so energy was a huge success story in the eight, uh, 70s. Okay, if you're a student of what happened, right? And, and so, again, this year, energy has been the best place to have capital. And it doesn't have to be aggressive energy. I mean, my largest position right now in the energy space are pipelines in the US with a 7.5% yield. Okay, I'll take that all day. The net, the, the, the you know, capital uh, appreciation is uh, happening and I'm collecting a yield on, on pipelines. But you, you know? just said something quite interesting there. You'll take a 7% yield. A lot of people are looking for Moby Dick. They're looking for this one, this one investment that they're going to retire off of. Now, I think you've seen a lot of that actually with crypto investment. You've seen a lot of people get very rich very quick off a lot of the stocks in it, well, a lot of the positions in crypto. And actually, as soon as Terra Luna went to the wall, you're talking about people losing their entire, their entire retirement. In many respects, people are losing their houses and businesses because actually everything they had was pumped into a coin that they never think thought would collapse. And they weren't thinking the 7%. They were thinking tens of thousands of percent based on the original position in which they bought him. You're now talking about being that more steady, building up on compounding. Well, that, that, excuse me, that, that is correct what I'm talking about. And what you just described is the natural um, expression of easy money from central banks for over a decade. And, and so what it did was ju it just ingrained in people's minds that the Fed's always there to support. So there's a Fed put, the market will always go up. And so that forces people further and further out on the risk curve. And what investors need to understand right now is it's the opposite. The, the Fed's done. The Fed can't support the market because we've got inflation through the roof. So there's nothing they can do at this stage. And so um, now that the wipeout has occurred, right, your innovative stocks, you know, the ARC funds, uh, okay, I mean, those, that's just the most embarrassing situation I've seen maybe in my professional career, 
I don't understand how you could trot somebody out on CNBC every week and have her talk about um, the valuations of innovative stocks. And as they implode, continue to trot her out. She continues to say, and this is the thing that really blew my mind, the market has it wrong. Let me tell you something, Peter. If you ever say that to yourself, go into the bathroom, look in the mirror and say it again and see what it feels like. If you're saying the market has it wrong, you're in big trouble. I mean, you need to stop what you're doing and start over, right? So now we have the ARC funds completely completing the ARC, if you will, and unwinding 100% of the gains from the Fed-induced explosion of 2020. All right, so we have to reorder our thinking now of how to put capital to work. And it really comes down to something simple that I can't believe Kathy doesn't understand. If the Fed's adding liquidity, the market goes up. If the Fed's reducing liquidity, which means raising rates, reducing their balance sheet, all the things they're talking about now, the market goes down. And so what I would say to investors right now who are trapped in this situation, you know, the, the, the fastest way to get out of a hole, right, is to stop digging. Right. So True. You, 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 stop, you stop looking for what can make me a ton of money in the next week. That You got to just stop. And it's time to start investing correctly again and saying, OK, I, I know it, it doesn't feel good, but I have to put that behind me. And the question is, what am I going to do next? And let's start making the right decisions next. And so this is a commodity backed market. And I've been saying since the late last year that 2022 is a commodity super cycle. It's starting. So you want to own energy. I've traded gold and silver. I'm not in them now. They're collapsing, but I'm sure I'll be back in them at some point. You know, all kinds of energy, liquid, natural gas type of investments, uh, obviously because of what's going on in, in Ukraine, Absolutely. are going to become more and more important in a portfolio. And like I was saying, you don't, you don't have to go out on the edge of risk in this market. You go to the edge of risk if you want. I mean, I never do, okay? It's just, I work too hard for my, my capital. My dad always taught me. My dad always taught me that money will find its rightful owner if you don't respect it, okay? And so I, I don't know about you, but I've worked real hard for the capital I've earned and I'm not willing to be disrespectful to it and throw it away on maybe this will go up tomorrow, you know, 100%. So... But if somebody wishes to do that, you have to do that at a time where the Fed is adding liquidity and doing it with you. So now is the time to say, okay, look, forget about what happened to me. What am I going to do next? How do I plan for the future? Okay, I need commodity back type investments. I can collect in the case of pipelines here in, in the U.S. I'm not sure if pipelines could be held in portfolios, maybe um. I know, for instance, in Europe, I mean, some ETFs can't be held, you know, it's in, in equity portfolios, but there's different ways to do this. I mean, I know um, some of the big energy companies like Shell Corporation, which is a huge liquid natural gas company that has a real nice yield. Now's the time to start putting those in the portfolio. You're going to get capital appreciation because of the energy prices that are continuing to go higher. Mm. And you're going to collect the yield while you do it. You know, and you start rebuilding your portfolio one step at a time. And to make the kind of investments you're talking about, what do you reckon the minimum you should be looking at having available to start investing? I, you know, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, everybody's situation is different. I know at the Arm Report, we literally have some subscribers that have more than $10 million in the market and some that have 10,000. I mean, so I, I call it a virtual hedge fund because at a, at a hedge fund, we would all, you know, you'd have a pool of capital, you'd have fund managers inside that hedge fund who would get allocated capital. At the virtual hedge fund, the Arm Report, everybody brings their own capital, right? So it doesn't matter if it's 10,000 or 10 million. And so um, everyone's got to start somewhere, Peter. And, and it would really depend on somebody's situation, you know, um, when you say the type of investments I'm talking about, sound investment decisions don't come down to how much money you have. Mm -hmm. If you start doing it right, even if you begin with $10,000, $20,000 or euros or what have you, you begin 
building the process. And, and quite frankly, when you have, when you start at that level and you build the right um, approach, as you grow, as you're able to put more capital in, you've earned the right to take more risk right. because you're executing correctly. You know, so I wouldn't, <clears throat> I know that, uh, um, I, I wouldn't limit somebody just because they, oh, I only have 10,000. Okay, start investing and start doing, start making the right decisions so that when you come into more capital, you know how to handle it. And that is the reason I asked the question because people sort of tuning in, there's going to be some people that, yeah, if they've got capital, but there's others that perhaps don't have the capital. And they may say, well, okay, well then that, that excludes me from investing. But that's not necessarily the case. It's just, okay, what can you invest and how can you invest it and how can you start building? Because really what you're saying, it's important to start, whatever you do is important to start building the yeah, right way. It's important. Absolutely. It's important to start building the right way. It's, I think a lot of people make the mistake of waiting until they have more, more capital. And then, you know, when they get started, you're, you're going to make some mistakes. Okay. So nothing wrong with getting started early. Your mistakes will be smaller. You'll learn. You'll start making the right decisions. And then as you grow, you'll, you'll already have ingrained the correct approach to managing capital, which is to do your research and use a whiteboard instead of your portfolio as a, as a trash can. Use your whiteboard. Execute algorithmically if you can. Okay. And then have strong stop loss disciplines to save yourself from your own ego. That's why we have stop loss disciplines and, and risk management rules. Because we all think we're brilliant. We all think we have great investment ideas. I mean, <clears throat> let's be honest, Peter. How did I come up with this approach? It's because I've blown up in my investing career. And I hate to say it, but I've blown up more than once. Okay, I've been doing it almost 35 years. And out of those cycles, I said, wait a minute, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Right. And the number one piece is to not marry an investment, to not have an ego about it, to not be a holder. You heard of holders? Hold on for dear life. It's a new thing yeah. that crypto yeah. people like to say. That, that can only come out of an era of unreal Fed largesse. That's the only way people could think that holding on for dear life is an investment strategy. That's just a way to ruin your capital it, because your, your ego is getting in the way and you're not recognizing, hey, I got to protect capital that I've earned. So. so in your situation, how much time do people normally spend doing this a week? <clears throat> Excuse me. So a lot of people have got spend... doing the research and everything. I mean, how much time does this take up? Because a lot of people have still got a day job. <laughs> That they need that's to true. That, that's a good point. That's a good point. So yeah, we have um, we we have um, a fair number of our virtual hedge fund members that are literally on the desk with me all day. So what I do is I run a live trading desk. I'm sharing my screen. I'm you know I'm day trading. I'm working on investment research, and I just share my whole process. And people come and go onto our virtual trading desk. Some of them are with me all day. It depends on the type of investor you are. I have four portfolios. And so I break my own personal capital. Really, the armor report is a reflection of how I run my own personal money. Okay, so I just literally say this is what I do. I got four portfolios. One is like a traditional growth portfolio. One's a dividend only portfolio. One's an index only portfolio. And then one is an ETF based portfolio. And so they all follow the same basic strategies, these three stages, but we invest in, in different things. And so at any one time, like for instance, the index only portfolio has been cash almost, almost the entire time since last December, okay? So um, in those portfolios, where, whereas for instance, the dividend portfolio, I hold things longer. I've been in, you know, invested in pipelines for over a year or so. Those are some of those positions are long term investments, but I digress. So how much time do people spend on the desk with me? You know, really depends if you're a, some people like to day trade with me. So I trade the indexes, you know, and we can we can use options and those types of things. But 
So if you're trading the indexes with me, people are on the desk all day. I trade volatility. We do a lot of um, hedge fund type of trading, and I, I um, teach individuals how to do that. Right. But you know, others come in for lunch. Others come in, in the last hour of the day to see how we're changing the portfolios and if we are. So it really depends on an individual and what they're comfortable with. And what their people, goals are. What their goals are. Yeah. And you help them with the goals and stuff like that. I will. I will do that. You know, I, I'm. I, you know, if somebody needs to 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 spend some time in a, from a coaching point of view and saying, okay, here's the capital. How do I come up with my you know risk tolerance and my goals? And I try to walk them through what my personal process is, and then they take that as a jumping off point and how they you know how they might address their portfolio. You know. And if people are interested in sort of wanting to reach out, connect, check out your platform, check out what you do with a view of potentially wanting to become investors, what's the best way to do that? Well, I mean, we can, um, you can check us out on our uh, website, armorreport.com, A-R-M-R report.com. I also, you know, every Saturday at 1130 Eastern Standard Time, we do a YouTube video a week in review for everybody to join where we go over all of the activity of the prior week and then how we're setting ourselves up to trade and invest in, you know, in the next week. And that's a good way to get a taste of what we do um, at the Armour Report. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I mean, we could go on forever with this. I mean, it's such a huge topic. And maybe in the future, we'll look at maybe breaking it down into a very specific area because I think a lot of people will benefit from investing. Everybody that kind of is in business I would say, is in the business of wanting to create wealth. And this is just one great way of creating wealth. I agree. And I appreciate my time with you. Thanks for having me on. And I'd be happy to come back and chat whenever you wish. If you're looking to scale your business and you need a little bit of help on looking at the areas where you might have some blockages, head over to borker.com and get in touch. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please like it, subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes and share it with other people who may benefit. And remember, failing to learn is learning to fail. Please stay safe. And Brett, thank you once again. Take care. Thank you.